the Judicial Council of California, Criminal Justice Services. Today's webinar, Recidivism Reduction Fund Grant, Data Collection, Administrative Duties, and Responsibility will be the focus of this webinar. It will be done in two parts. The first part will focus on primarily on grant administration. The second part, which is briefer, will focus on data collection. Future calls will be scheduled for more in-depth discussion of data set collection. A few housekeeping rules for you. During the program, you will be listening to the webinar presenter over your local phone connection. If you have several participants in the room with you, please have them come close to your speakerphone or polycom so that everyone can hear. During the webinar, you will be able to hear the presenter walking you through the online presentation and be able to see the presenter's PowerPoint slides and other materials presented. If you do not see the PowerPoint presentation, please contact the webinar administrator, Juan Palomares, via email and provide a contact number to reach you. It's important that you do not place your phone on hold. Some phones can play hold music uh, that will disturb the presenter and other participants on the call. Questions. If you have any questions during the presentation, you will have an opportunity to ask by typing in the integrated chat feature located to the right of your webinar page below the Who is Participating box. Very important. Please ensure your questions are sent to facilitators and not to This webinar is being recorded for training purposes and will be posted online in the criminal justice webpage. Thank you for joining us today. And let me introduce your presenters. Martha Wright, Senior Court Service Analyst, Judicial Counsel, Criminal Justice Services. She will be covering the responsibility as I mentioned earlier, will be the primary focus of this call. And Francine Burns, Supervising Research Analyst, who will talk briefly about data. Hope that helps you as we move forward. And again, welcome. We'll begin with Martha Wright. Hello, everybody. This is Martha. Thank you for being here on this call. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm new to the unit. I just joined last week officially. Um, I am going to be the project manager for the RRF grants. You'll see my name replacing Shelley Curran, just so you know. Um, but Shelley is still overseeing and managing, but for the day-to-day, -day, uh, you'll see my name as the project manager. So we're going to discuss really four different areas of your reporting task. So we're going to be talking about four areas um, of administrative duties, really, for your projects. We're yeah. going to do an overview of the contract. Okay. We're going to talk about fiscal that's reporting that's and what's required there. We're going to talk about program reporting. And then finally, at the end, we're going to talk about data collection and your data reporting. So just to sort of take a step back and talk about this fund and its purpose and why we're all here, it's the Budget Act of 2014. In that act, the legislature directed the Judicial Council to develop and administer a grant program for trial courts implementing practices known to reduce adult offender recidivism, a recidivism reduction fund. So then on February 19th, 2015, the Judicial Council approved the allocation of what was approximately $13.65 million in grants to 27 of you all, Superior Courts, from this Recidivism Reduction Fund, and grants to your courts both pre-trial and collaborative court programs were awarded. So we're going to talk a little bit about the structure of your contract. These contracts are administering the funds that you're going to be receiving over the next three years. So they are three-year contracts, more specifically contracts across over three fiscal years. They were executed, as you know, because you all have them in place, April 2015, and they expire April 30, 2017. Just as an overview, year one is your firm fixed allocation 
Yeah, that's so. the upfront amount that you were provided at the beginning of the contract execution. And we'll talk about all of this in more detail. This is just your overview. Year two is when the reimbursable funding begins, and year two will begin with a contract amendment, and it will include any approved budget revision that might be necessary. If you would like, if that's appropriate, we'll talk more about that. And then year three, same thing, reimbursable funding, also begins with a contract amendment at the beginning of that fiscal year and including any revisions necessary. So another way to look at it, really, by the years or by fiscal years, uh, one is the program startup year. So that one is the short year that just started last month. Three, it's three months total, April 1 to June 30. Year two, then, is your ongoing operations, what we just called earlier the reimbursable year. That's a full fiscal year, 12 months, July 1, 2015 to June 30, 2016. And then your final year is a little shorter, year three, also reimbursable, fiscal year 2016-17. That's 10 months, July 1, 2016 through April 30, 2017. So April 30 is the end of the contract date. So we'll look a little bit um, closer at each year, specifically beginning with year one, the year that we're currently in. So as we mentioned, that's the year for which you have already received um, your firm fixed upfront payment. It was consistent with the budget that you submitted to us and was included in your contract. All of you have submitted your first invoice for that amount and payments have been processed. You may have even received them. It looked like from what we could tell in our financial system that payments were made. So then it's going to be contract attachment eight, the year one initial term expense report that verifies the completion of your year one expenditure. So you've already invoiced for the upfront amount. At the beginning, the way you will invoice at the end of year one is with attachment eight. If necessary, year one can extend beyond July 1, 2015. I know that that's a question that many of you have asked. I can talk a little bit more about that, but I wanted to make a note that um, your year one expenditure can extend beyond July 1, if necessary, to allow for complete expenditure of that whole initial allocation. I'd like to stop for a moment. Any questions? Uh, I'm checking questions now. If there are questions about the year one program startup, no questions, we'll continue. Okay, so we'll look at year two. So year two is when the reimbursement period starts. Year two is your ongoing operations, the full fiscal year, 2015-16. Funds reimbursement will begin, as we mentioned before, after you've completed your year one allocation. And again, you'll verify that with a tab. Your funds will be reimbursed consistent with your budget, the budget document, the narrative justification that you've provided. You'll invoice for reimbursement the way you do for all reimbursable grants with us per, based on the contract, your contract attachment five on the 20th of each month, generally after each expense. So one note I wanted to make, um, and also a question that many of you have asked about the end of year two, given that the end of year two, goes to June 30, uh, the date in the contract was earlier. It didn't allow you enough time to invoice. Your final invoices for year two will be due by July 20, 2016, and that will be a note made in your contract amendment, which we will talk more about in just a minute. So there are a couple of stars here. We'll see a couple of notes that we've made about changes and clarification. Okay, so year three, ongoing operations. Again, also like year two, uh, the funds will be reimbursed based on your budget. You'll invoice for reimbursement with contract attachment five on the 20th of each month after the expense. And again, a correction here to these dates because this year ends April 30th, 2017. Your final invoices for that year will be due by May 20th, 2017. 
Um, and I'll also note that attachment five uh, is an Excel document that's on the website. We'll, we'll refer to the website a lot because there are lots of tools and documents there for you. And it includes all the tabs, which you'll be using for all the different kinds of fiscal reporting you'll be doing. So we're going to move um, on to the contracting part of this, contracting for your second and then third year. As you know, you already have the contract in place, which doesn't expire until April 2017, but we are going to execute a contract amendment that the vehicle will use to start your year two. So year two will start with a signed contract amendment. Only what is changing in your contract will be noted in the amendment. It'll highlight your second year amount. It'll highlight any other changes that might need to take place uh, that need to be clarified in the contract. I've mentioned two of them already regarding the dates. Um, we're going to put the contract amendment in place in July 2015, but also keeping in mind that your year two doesn't officially begin, as we mentioned before, until your expenditure of year one, that upfront allocation is complete. And you let us know when that's done by submitting your attachment eight. We have a question. Uh -huh. um, let me go right to it. Uh, if year one expenditures need to be extended beyond July 1, what needs to be submitted and when, uh, for how long can we extend? So a lot of you have asked about your upfront allocation um, and the size of it and being able to spend it. You can extend it beyond July 1 if you need to. Just let me know. Give me a call, send an email. You'll get all the pertinent contact information at the end of um, the webinar. But let me, as project manager, know. Um, we'll discuss it. You can take beyond July 1 if needed. Uh, just keep in mind, though, that this is a three-year contract. We do have, you know, ultimately a finite period to spend it. So the farther you get into year two, um, potentially the more complications or changes we'll have to your budget. But we do understand some of you may need to go past July 1. Just let me know as soon as you know, and we'll discuss proceeding that way. Okay, also, uh, lots of you have also asked about budget modifications, um, of course, because they often need to be done as things shift and change a bit. That will happen. I would say that the first really best opportunity um, to make budget modifications would be when we amend your contract to start years two and three. So what you could be doing now is considering how your year one expenditures are proceeding and deciding whether you think you'll need a modification based on how year one is going. If you do, again, just call me. We'll start the conversation. We'll make some notes and um, we'll proceed accordingly. But you can modify your budget and include that modified updated budget in your new contract when we start year two, and then if needed, when we start year three. If you need to do one uh, for any reason at some different point in time, just call and we'll uh, find the best way to update your file with your new budget. But your budget is our working document for us to uh, sort of compare against the invoices that you're sending, so we want to make sure that your budgets are updated. Um, so we have a couple of specific notes that we wanted to uh, discuss and things that some of you asked about and things we want to make sure you're clear on because we wanted to make sure that everybody got the training they need in these projects as they're implemented. There will be a good amount of travel from each of you. We want to make sure that you're aware that and typically this is the way it works in almost all of your budgets, that the court will reimburse the travelers. Many of you have partners that are traveling from other agencies, county agencies. The court will reimburse your travelers based on the amount that's in your budget, and then the court will submit for reimbursement under the grant. So essentially your travelers submit to you, they get reimbursed, you forward all that, and you submit to us for the reimbursement for all the travel. And we just want to make, make a note, make sure you're aware um, that the travel or training for participants, uh, the conferences that you may be going to is specific to your work on the RRF project. Many of you have multiple projects, of course, as we all do, that you might be working on that might overlap. Just want to make sure that you're keeping in mind that your travel for the conferences is 
and, and it is in your budget, RRS specific. And then timesheets. Also, um, almost all of you have some court staff time in the salary section of your budget. So you're going to be submitting timesheets for those staff that are getting reimbursed with grant funds. Um, the timesheets are the tool for accounting really for that person's full position. So some staff uh, may have time allocated to multiple projects. The timesheet that you'll see that you'll be submitting, that's one of the resources on the RRS page, is a timesheet that has columns for different projects, so where you can clarify specifically which time is the RRS time, there may be general funded time, and any other project time. So that one person is accounted for wholly up to the whole full amount of their position. So we're going to move into talking about quarterly program reporting. Uh, we covered most of the fiscal reporting. So now this is on the program side of things. So for your reporting on your progress, on your activities, um, you know, the hiring, the trainings, how all that is going. For year one, because it is your upfront expenses, because it is a short time period, really your contract attachment eight, which we already discussed, will serve as your program report. That's where you're going to indicate what you spent your upfront money on. Um, so there's not a lot of detailed program reporting there. When we get to the data section, the data folks will talk a little bit about an initial high-level report that they'll want to see for year one. But in terms of program reporting, it's years two and three where you will use attachment nine. It's the quarterly grant administration and tracking report. And you'll see that it's going to be completed online. Uh, there will be a link on the RRF website. It's not there yet because you won't need to use the link for a few months. But attachment nine itself is there so that you can see the kinds of things that are being asked. You have a template for the information that's being asked in attachment nine. And then during the month when that report is due, you'll find a link on the RRF website to an online SurveyMonkey version of that exact same information where you can type it in online and submit it. That allows us to work better with the information that you submit. So your year two dates for reporting, um, and also just note that this is on page D10 of your contract. Your year two dates for reporting are October 31, January 31, April 30, July 31. And then for year three, same dates in 2016 and 17. So those are your quarterly program reporting dates with attachment nine being used to report your progress. Um, we covered most of this. So again, the template uh, for the information that's needed is on the website so that you can see what's being asked. And it's really a summary of activities. You can let us know about challenges. This is also a good way for us um, on a regular basis to point out any issues that might be coming up and do some troubleshooting and to see how your spending is going. So again, you'll do it with a SurveyMonkey survey and it'll be available online. So I wanted to let you know also about a tool that we have created. Um, there are, you know, we've been talking about the contracting dates, the fiscal reporting dates, the program reporting dates. We're also going to be talking about the data reporting, uh, and that's a lot, definitely. So we want to make sure that you're clear on the date that everything is due. On the RRF website, you'll see now this tool, and it really is just four sections summarizing for you the contracting dates and notes you need, the financial reporting dates, documents you'll be using, program progress reporting, and then your data and evaluation reporting with contacts at the bottom. So you'll find that tool, again, on the website. And it's just sort of a desk aid, something that you can use um, as you're going about your years and getting everything submitted. Um, we wanted to just give you a little peek at the website. I'm sure you all have been there, but again, all forms that you'll need are on our webpage. This is what the webpage looks like. When you scroll down, 
you'll see down lower on the web page, this is where the forms are. The new tool that I just showed you will also be on this website. And are there any questions at this point? Because we'll switch to data. Uh, some of you have also asked about the PowerPoint that will be made available to you. Uh, it will be posted uh, as well as if you need to have a hard copy, we'll make sure immediately after we can make that available to you as well. No hey, questions? Hope. I, Hi, yeah, how are you, I, I do have a question. I'm good. Um, so my question is, is there an amount that we can deviate from our budget without having to ask for a budget modification? You know, like less than 10% or if it's consistent with our, our proposal? I think generally the rule is 10% um, within a budget category um, okay. is allowable. I will confirm that for you. I would say as a rule, anything more than that, yeah, then does get into a situation where we, did, we would need to make sure that we're um, rearranging the budget in the way that you know the funds are gonna be spent. But okay. I believe 10% or under is a, is a general rule. Um, and if that's different, then we'll let you know. Great, thank you. Any other questions? And we can also return to questions too. Just wanna to make sure that if you have any questions right now. Okay. Okay, great. Hi everyone, my name is Francine Byrne. I supervise the research projects in the Criminal Justice Office. Uh, I wanted to first uh, thank you for joining us on this webinar and also to congratulate you all on the grant awards. We're very excited about this project here. I want to take a moment to introduce the uh, research and program team, some of us that are in here. This is not the only things that we do, but uh, we have the main data contact researcher that will be working on this project is Rob Lauer. Okay. Hi, uh, looking forward to working with all of you. And then we also have, um, we'll have some other subject matter expertise for pretrial is Tara Nisi. And we have Melissa Lavarte, who many of you have already spoken to in the um, beginning with your budgets. Uh, and Sa Sandy Hollinsworth, who will, is from Grants Accounting, uh, will be taking all of your information. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're excited about this team that we have compiled. And we will have contact uh, information on the final slide for all the, the people that you will be needing to contact for this project. So I'm going to just speak very briefly about some of the data collection requirements related to this grant and why we are doing it. Our intent on this webinar, however, is to really just touch upon some of the requirements and the time periods and then let you know that we will be separating the two groups in terms of data collection, the pretrial and the collaborative justice um, programs because they're so different. We will be conducting some trainings um, and monthly phone calls actually until we get the data collection up and running uh, for a while, but they will be separated. So we will have a collaborative court uh, training on the data elements and um, later a, uh, or, and a pretrial one as well. I can't remember this, which order they go in. But the reason why we are uh, doing a pretty substantial data collection is because we have been charged in that budget language that Martha already mentioned uh, to establish outcome measures that are appropriate for each of the programs. So we've drafted some for both collaborative courts and for uh, the pretrial programs. We also need to annually report the aggregated data to both the Department of Finance and the Joint Legislative Budget Committee. And in addition, we will have a final report uh, that will actually be on the effectiveness of the programs to enhance public safety and improve offenders' outcomes um, that will be due four years after the grant awards. There's additional uh, language in the Budget Act that we uh, will have to hit on, upon as well, but those are the uh, main things with it. As part of the reporting then, we will be asking for individual level data from um, all of the courts, however, all the programs. This, depending on the size of the, the program and the appropriateness of the data collection, we will be tailoring many of these data elements to suit your program, and um, in the event that it's a very, very large program, we also will be allowing for some, uh, sorry, sampling of the, of a number of the participants in the program. So the data time frame. Um, so as Martha mentioned already, uh, that we will, for the first year, which is just the April, May, June time frame for this fiscal period, 
Uh, we will have very high level summary information required. You will be um, attaching it with attachment eight. It will, we will have sort of an addendum that goes with it. It will only be if you've actually uh, provided services or done assessment or had some sort of contact with participants in those courts during this startup period. If you have not, you will not need to actually submit that. Uh, be, you will need to submit attachment eight, but not the extra data. Um, then, but if you have actually already begun uh, having people either assessed or enter the program, we will ask just very high level information about the number um, and uh, sort of how they touched upon the program. So, but then in um, early June, as I mentioned before, we will begin these monthly data calls. And the purpose of these calls is to really make sure that we identify the data elements that are feasible to collect that we'll also be measuring the program in the way that uh, we need to measure it for the legislature. So the first one will be um, June 5th for pretrial grants, and we will send out additional information um, after this call. And the second call will be on June 8th. Uh, for collaborative justice grants. So again, you would only attend one or the other, depending on which grant you received. This call is really mainly for the key data contact people or person in your court. So the person who will actually be submitting the data to us. Uh, and if you cannot make those dates uh, for whatever reason, uh, again, we will send out an email after this call and uh, you can just let us know and we'll do a follow-up call with the courts that cannot actually make those two dates or one of the two dates. So then after those calls, um, we will, on July 1, really begin the individual level data collection in earnest. We've drafted up a, um, it's actually an Excel spreadsheet, sort of a data collection tool that we will be distributing um, before the training calls. And um, we will have those provided to, for you so you can actually use them um, as your data collection tool if you'd like, or if you can provide the data elements in a different fashion if that's more appropriate for you as long as we have it electronically and in the proper format, that's fine as well. And again, during the calls, we will get a little more clarity on what to expect from each of the courts. The first uh, data then collection report will be due on October 31st along with all your other grant reports as Martha mentioned. This will cover the period from July through September. And the data elements that we will be collecting are, um, are identified already in attachment 10 online. They will be modified somewhat depending on the program and that sort of is the purpose of these monthly calls as well. So they will be tailored to the program uh, and we will, during that time of the calls, we will also be um, addressing any questions that you might have about the particular data elements. So again, the data reporting, um, the quarterly will begin in July, which will be the individual level data. Uh, we will also be asking for essentially what would be a data cover sheet, um, which will have some summarized um, aggregate level information. Again, it will be very high level, number of people assessed, number of, um, of people who entered your program. This will vary, of course. It'll be different between the pretrial and the collaborative court programs, but it will um, just be a really high level, almost a cover sheet to go along with the individual level data. Yeah, we have a question and it's around year one. Uh, in year one, we plan uh, for help to facilitate our planning, which we will, um, uh, will or will not use. Uh, can we roll over the unused budgeted amount for other purposes? Uh, for the year one upfront costs, you are going to need to expect Spend the full amount and expend it in the general in categories that are generally consistent with your budget. If you if it takes you because one of your line items is going to change slightly or something you're not going to use the funding for, if it takes you past July one to spend that full amount, then that's okay. So give me a call. Just know that you may shift a little bit as long as it's still consistent with your budget. Some of what you're spending your uh, first year expenses on, and you can also take past July 1 if needed, but we do want to have that attachment submitted to us that confirms that you've spent that amount 
and on what. And in that attachment, you'll get to provide a little more clarity on if something changed, if something shifted slightly, and what you spent that year one allocation on. So that's a long way of saying rather than rolling it over, we're going to just ask that you keep spending it, that you finish spending it, tell us what you spent it on, then we will begin the year two reimbursement period. So that is um, all that we have uh, specifically on the data collection requirements as well. Here are the staff contacts for this um, program, and we will be sending out this PowerPoint, as we mentioned previously. Uh, and so emails and telephone numbers are all included. There should be uh, most, most everyone that you need to uh, be in contact with. And, and there's also the RRF email, which is at the top right under program office. Uh, that we is most of us have access to that as well. So feel free to contact us in any one of those ways. And if there's any additional questions, that, that this is at sort of the end of our PowerPoint, but we can now open it up for questions on on any of the items. Please, any questions? You can also uh, still use the chat if you'd like uh, the feature on the webinar. If you'd like to type in questions as well or raise your hand. If you do not have any questions uh, now, you can also submit them at any time, mm -hmm. and we'll be happy to answer those questions. It is our intent to actually post the answers to questions that were not asked while we're on air. Hi, on the month, this is Neil Taniguchi from San Mateo. Is on the monthly yeah. data call, is that an individual call to the courts, or is that going to be like a WebEx? That will um, be in a conference call. So it will all of the um, collaborative courts will have a monthly call, and a separate call will be conducted with the pretrial court. So it will be the main data contact person. We will plan to do these every month until the the data system is really up and running. We're starting with a draft data elements, um, and then we will continue doing that until we have all the data definitions finalized. We I believe there will also be program calls, or there might be um, program calls as well to just talk about the programs in general. Or during those monthly data calls, we can use some of that time to just talk about how the programs are going, et cetera. If there are really uh, more significant issues to deal with uh, that are not necessarily appropriate in the data calls to deal with on a conference call, we can do those separately as well. Does that Thank answer you. your question? Hi, this is Lisa from Sonoma. Hi. Can you guys hear us? Uh -huh. I can. Oh, good, because we didn't think so earlier. Um, I had a question about those of us who are moving over to new systems right in the middle of this, and I know that we are one of, I think it's 28 or some, maybe 36 courts that are moving from an old system, uh, case management system, to a new one. Um, <laughs> Do you have any guidance um, in terms of expectations for how we should be preparing for that? I, I, I thought what we had uh, submitted as part of our grant would be the basis for our data collection, um, but of course we left question marks and things to be determined. Um, do we have a sense of when we'll know for absolute truth what we're supposed to be tracking? Um, because uh, we are in the middle of actual data conversion that's going on right now in our court, and I don't want to try and add something else to it uh, without knowing for sure where we're going. So the data elements are already up on the website. Um, uh, the, it's attachment 10, it's not actually an attachment, but it says here's a list of the data elements. Uh, and I, I'm sorry, Lisa, I can't remember, are you on the, in the collaborative court or the pretrial? Um, we're pretrial. Okay. So. Um, that, that those are all of them are in there, uh, and we do, as I mentioned, already have drafted a sort of an Excel spreadsheet to help track it. But again, if you if you have a system that you don't need to actually do data double data entry, we you know that's great as well. So we can take it in a different way. But if you take a look at that, we did vet um, most of these with the a few of the different um, courts already. I, um, or, and so I just wanted to say that you can take a look at it now, and during the call that we'll be setting up on the 5th, we can, you can certainly let us know, contact Rob, if there's any concerns about the, the um, data elements that are already identified. 
beforehand, but that would be the time to sort of uh, decide. But those, those data elements, the general data elements are already up. It's just the way that we are asking for the data and the data definitions that are still, um, will be worked out with, with feedback from all the participating courts. Well, and Lisa, this is Tara. Um, I, I think you raise a really good point because this does affect so many different mm -hmm. courts. And I mean, I think the the main point that we want to try to make is that we are, I mean, obviously going to work with you as much as possible to make this something that's manageable for you. So the draft data elements that you see on the website are generally designed to be at more of the aggregate level. Um, the right. stuff that we haven't yet provided is more of the individual level sort of template that you can use. But, I mean, either way, we, we don't want this to be something that is impossible for you to accomplish. We certainly obviously have our own reporting requirements that we have to adhere to, but we're willing to work with you as much as possible to figure out if there are certain things that you can't report on to us, you know, we can talk about that on the data calls, and if it means we need to schedule like a separate, sub, a separate call with courts, you know, that are going specifically to a new case management system, then I think that the conversation will be easier to have once we're actually talking in detail about specific elements that we're looking for. Fabulous. Thank Fabulous. you guys Thank so you. much. Sure. I do want to add, too, that um, when you do see the data elements, that uh, some of them will not necessarily be possible, I would imagine, from the court. So some of them, especially for the pretrial, we do have to ask things about um, percent of uh, or number of people, or I guess percent really, of uh, pre-trial uh, jail population. So there are certain things that you will have to work with your justice system partners to gather the data on. That would not necessarily be individual level tracking, that kind of thing, but um, the intent, I think, is that uh, there will be a, a certain amount of, of interacting with other partners on this as well. We have another question. Um, we are supporting three collaborative courts with this grant. Will we report data on all three programs separately or combined into one program? Uh, we will likely, and that's an um, excellent question, uh, it, likely we will need them separated, but it really depends on the program, and again, that is something that we uh, will have to do on the, to discuss on the data calls. We know that there will be slightly different, these programs are very, very different. <clears throat> Um, and so we know that there will be slight different tweaks for each and every one of the 27 in some ways. Rob is not happy about that. <laughs> but yeah, so so in that case, we would like we would need it likely separately is the way that we think that it will come down. Uh, if the numbers are too large to confidently track, we can um, discuss the uh, doing a random sample of the people going to the program. Yes, um, I'd like to know how soon we're going to get the final version of the data elements. So we should be getting that to you probably the next day or two, but certainly before the calls. We're setting up the calls. It will be either, um, hopefully, we won't have a, the data definitions included, but we should have something by early, by Monday at the latest. Okay, so this is this is happening fairly quickly then. Yes. Yeah, okay. Sarah, Thank you. Sarah, I have one other point I wanted to make. Part of the reason why some of this stuff is in draft form is also because we're trying to, as much as possible, allow for flexibility and for each court to sort of provide feedback on what is feasible and what's not feasible. So obviously there's a lot of variation um, even within pretrial or even within collaborative courts. So we're trying to be as flexible as possible and, and have one sort of data reporting tool that we can use for each program that's consistent across all programs, but we know that that's almost impossible. So, I mean, that's part of the, I just want to point that out, that that's part of the reason why it's sort of being called draft is because we're trying to allow for some flexibility there. Any additional questions, please? If no, there are no additional questions, thank you so much for your time. And again, if you have questions later, please feel free to ask uh, those and those electronically, and we'll respond to those, hopefully post those answers uh, for all of you to view later. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.